<laughs> Welcome back. It's been a long mm -hmm. time away, nearly two years, right, Karen? It has been. Welcome back to Your Wealth Hour with my co-host, Karen Casino, and myself, Ryan White. With us today, we have Elizabeth Tresp, as well as Kevin Day. They are with the estate planning firm of Tresp Day and Associates here in Solana Beach. Kevin's been on the show for, boy, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years. It's been a long time, it's been a long uh, time. many times on the show. And uh, well, we're going to rehash some of, those, uh, some of those old concepts and maybe have some new ones as well. Mm -hmm. So today, as you might have guessed, estate planning and asset protection 101. So starting off very quickly, why is it people need estate planning? Very general question. Like that's the softball <laughs> I'm going to toss up to you. Okay. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons why people need an estate plan. And before you sit down with a planner to talk about it, you want to establish what your goals are. And your goals are um, varied depending on your personal circumstance. So one of them could be succession planning, right? If you have a business, who's mm -hmm. going to run it when you pass away? Where do you want it to go? Um, special needs children, that's a big consideration that you want to plan for, um, for later in life. Um, also, protecting what you've built, right? A lot of people have um, causes and charities that they want to support when they pass away, and this is the way that you can do that. As well as just avoiding probate. So probate is, Huge. most people have heard of probate. Um, it's expensive and it's time consuming. So um, before you sit down and, and think about what works for you, you want to sit there and think about your life and your circumstances so that you have a focus to accomplish um, those goals through your planning. Well, tell us a little bit about how terrible probate is. I don't think <laughs> the general population knows really what that means. So I handle, I like probates, I handle <laughs> probates, okay. but it's, not, it's, not, it's definitely not to the benefit, you, you want to avoid it if you can. Okay. okay? Um, probate is a process <laughs> here in California where it's, it's all governed through the courts. And if you don't have an entity established to transfer your assets outside of probate, mm -hmm. um, then you'll be subject to it. And, and that is a collective total of assets of up to $166,000. And people that own real property here in California, you're, you're over that. Um, also, probate, the filings in the court are, you can, the public can access them. So it's your information and sometimes intimate pieces of your life very that public. people can just down, it's very public. Um, and oftentimes, I don't know about you, but no thank you. I would prefer <laughs> to not have that. Um, it's, a, it's a roadmap. Uh, there, yeah. there was a, a criminal group that it took them three years to f hunt them down because the will, which is, does not avoid probate, a lot of people think, oh, I have a will, so I'm fine. No, will still goes through probate. And it was a roadmap because it said, oh, your you know, mother's wedding ring and your great aunt's brooch is in the sock in the brown shoes. And the oh, silver no. coin collection is up on the shelf in the den. And, and people would go to the public record while everybody's just calling the wow. family to get them in and they would clear it out. And then everybody is in the house oh, pawing no. through things yep. and destroying any evidence. And that's how they were doing. They were just oh, going no. to court, looking at wills, seeing where <coughs> things were and robbing the place. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's exactly right. So public. It comes public, out yes. public. public. And like you, and you touched sport. on this, but I think it's worth reiterating. Tell me again the monetary <laughs> amount where in which if you are over... You are subject uh -huh. to probate if you do not have an estate plan. One hundred and sixty-six thousand. One hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars. And collective so, total, yep. collective total. So that doesn't mean. So in San Diego, it means if you own a home. Frankly, it doesn't matter how much you owe on the home. It's the mm -hmm. gross value the gross of value. the home, yeah. right? Regardless of what you owe. So if you own a home in San Diego, mm -hmm. you need to have an estate plan. You need a trust. Yeah, you need an estate plan. One hundred percent. So that gets in the next step. What are the basics of an estate plan? What are the things we need in this estate plan? I suspect there's more than one item. There is. So every estate plan, the basic estate plan, is going to have specific pieces that plan for your financial life while you're living, okay, if you're incapacitated and when you pass away. Also, uh, medical decisions. So the initial document that's the base of an estate plan is the living trust. And generally, it's going to be a revocable living trust, which mm -hmm. means you can change it. During, during your life, right, as mm -hmm. your life circumstances change. 
it's going to hold properties that have um, a deed or a title, right? You transfer them in there. That's called funding the trust. And in that document, you'll have um, successor trustees that you've chosen, people you trust, to manage the financial assets that are in there when you can't, or when you pass away, or for the benefit of your children, however you're choosing to do that. You have a pour over will, which is a document that takes all of your personal property and pours it into the trust. Um, this is the jewelry that Kevin was just talking about, mm -hmm. and cars <coughs> and accounts that you didn't title into the trust. Um, you want to have a durable power of attorney. This is an important one. So a durable power of attorney, it's called durable because it survives your incapacity, right? And no one wants to think about that circumstance, but in this day and age, people are living a lot longer. and. Oftentimes, there's, there are cognitive difficulties that arise, right, which often make um, an elderly person susceptible to financial elder abuse. You yeah. want to have people that you trust in this document, agents that you've chosen, that you're comfortable with, to do things for you when you can't. And you don't know when you're going to be incapacitated. I mean, unfortunately, car accidents, surgeries, all these things happen. And you want to take control of that so that you can be confident um, that you're going to be taken care of in those circumstances. And then uh, advanced healthcare directive, medical decisions, agent. Oftentimes our clients will laugh and say, okay, well, I'm not giving it to them because they'll, you know, I, 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 you know, yeah. <laughs> but you, people that you trust that have mm -hmm. the philosophic, philosophical um, ideals that you do and understand what you want to happen. Um, a general assignment, which is very important and often forgotten. And it's what is used if you pass away <clears throat> and something was not funded into your trust, okay? Okay. Um, and that happens. So if you go to refinance your home, the bank yep. makes you take it out. Mm -hmm. And so this is um, the probate code in the state of California allows um, a trustee or a beneficiary to request the court to retroactively confirm an asset as a trust asset. And one of the things that it looks at is, uh, the court looks for, is a general assignment, which is saying you're intending all of your property to be a trust asset, and then also a detailed schedule of assets at the end of your trust. Mm -hmm. And a certificate of trust, which is a short form that lets institutions or whoever you're trying to do business with know that you have the right to do business as trustee. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned that's important, I know, um, in today's world is it's not just when people die and you did say this but it's it's important yeah. to to say it again it's if they become incapacitated because that's more likely to happen nowadays right is that if they just aren't able to run things you know what is yeah. going to happen if if they can't run things who's going to run things what's going to happen yeah, you what forget. do they want done? What about taxes? Who's going to pay your taxes? Who's going to pay your insurance? Mm -hmm. Who's going to keep up with your keep up with your insurance? Who's going to do all of those things? Your financial world that's outside <coughs> of a trust. There's a lot going on there that you need to consider and be prepared for. Um, and so these documents really they're really critical. And oftentimes people don't want to sit and think about these types of things, and that's understandable. But once you do you really have taken a proactive step in, in protecting yourself and your family. Um, it needs to be done. Yeah. So I've always thought there was four things you needed, but I think you might have gone five or six. What are the, what are the, what are the documents? Tell me again the documents. That you okay. What makes a basic one? Living trust. Yep. Pour over will. Okay. Durable power of attorney. Mm -hmm. Healthcare directive. Advanced healthcare directive. Yep. Those are the four I've always thought, but I think you had two more. Gener we do. I do a lot of Hegstad petitions, which is what okay. it's called when some when something wasn't funded into the trust. Okay. It's it's a um, essentially it's like we meant to put it in the trust. Obviously, our intent was there. Right. Okay. It saves a lot of money and a lot of time. <laughs> okay. So you want to make sure that your documents are drafted in a way that you can that's accessible to your trustees mm -hmm. or your beneficiary, um, and the certification of trust. So six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. That's it. That's a basic estate plan. Yes. Okay. Now, going off topic, script here just a little bit. Now, I remember. Here, no, I'm, here, I'm not going to talk about the chargers or anything. Okay. Like <laughs> I remember a few years back, the plan was always to get as much um, assets essentially out of the trust because of taxation purposes. Now, mm -hmm. the capital, the exemption, I suppose, for um, uh, the, the, t the cap on. Um, the death tax, I guess is what we call it, has changed mm -hmm. here recently. And what did that change up to now? You're talking about estate tax? Estate tax. Okay, so, tax, yes. so the estate yeah, tax, um, the federal estate tax exemption is mm -hmm. very high right now. It's over 11, 11 million yeah. per person. 
Um, but that is set to sunset, right? When is that sunset? Uh, 2025. 2025. And it's anticipated um, that it's going to come down much, much lower to an amount that will be um, significantly different than what it is currently, which also means that we have a great deal of disclaimer trusts out there, and those are great, right? Um, but also, you might be thinking about things differently. Uh, uh, with an exemption amount so high in portability between spouses, you're talking about 22 million, right? Right. So that's a large number. Large number. When that comes down, that affects planning. It makes it right. uh, it mm. makes it very interesting for us, but also critical for people to revisit their estate plan, as oftentimes trusts. I mean, they're long. They have a lot of language in there that's in there because of litigation that has happened over the years. And often people, they're not going to sit and read a 60-page document or 40-page document, 30-page, whatever mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, and you don't remember what you have. Sometimes people don't even remember who, what trustees they chose. Sometimes there's a child left out. Sometimes it's a child. <laughs> got, it, got it. Got it. Or maybe an ex-spouse left in. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, generally, in a horrible, yeah. horrible yeah. outcomes. Horrible, horrible outcomes. outcomes. Well, that's a good segue. What are some of the examples? What are examples of some of the bad things that can happen if people don't plan ahead? And you mentioned a few already, but I'm sure you've run into There's lots so of situations. And so scare them out there with all the terrible things I mean, that can happen. I don't happen. want to be a fear monger, but yeah. So there are many things that can go wrong. So, and I'm going to start with just simple things. So um, when you have a will and you can either do specific gifts to your beneficiaries, right? Okay. So I want so-and-so to have my guitar, guitar collection or the painting that they admired over a period of years. Um, you can also do something called a letter of instruction. If you don't have any of that, and depending okay. on your family <laughs> okay. dynamic mm -hmm. and how your your children, if you have children or family members, um, handle themselves, <laughs> the the personal property often is one of the most litigated issues. Oh, so yeah. I've been in mediation before for twelve hours over personal property, and not high value personal property, very sentimental, and. It's, it's interesting because people, so many clients say, no one's going to want my, no one wants my stuff. No one wants anything that's in my house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, no, that's not, you wait because they're going to be yeah. willing to fight for it because mom promised you the moonstone ring or you were supposed to get the grand piano or the family piano or the coin collection. I mean, it's a variety. People have so many different things. So that is a very litigated area. Having, I want so-and-so to get this. Just even a letter of instruction. This is who I want these things to go to is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, when you don't have an estate plan and you're in probate, we've had probates last six years. Probate, when, when people six are, years. when things are litigated, when there is an opportunity to object in, in court and there are issues that, there are hearings that need to be had, um, your estate can be held up for a very long time. I mean, generally it's 10 months to two years, but still that's a long time, right? Um, the fighting and family dynamics really are the biggest things. Um, there are, we come across deeds that are drafted, you know, suspicious deeds that are drafted by, by a, a neighbor. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> just, <neighbor>. There's different <laughs> things great. that happen. Yeah. Oh, oh, yep, yep, yep. There are different things that, um, that happen. Conservatorships are a wonderful tool. They are also, um, they're in court, right? They're court proceedings that are to protect somebody who doesn't have either physical or mental capacity anymore, right? They need someone to step in and care for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but conservatorships are very expensive and everything goes through the court. Um, it, it's definitely a last alternative. And when you have these documents in place, you avoid that. And that's, and judges look at that. They say, okay, what, what are the alternatives to a conservatorship? Right, mm -hmm. and conservatorships have been all in the news because of Britney Spears. So people who have seen, you know, that story, right? That's um, you want to you want to take control and plan for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So staying organized yep. with respect to what you have, especially in this personal property mm -hmm. realm, may save your family a lot yeah. of anguish. Well, also, so when you're talking about planning, and you have entrepreneurs or successful business people as you're building you're not paying attention to the little picture, right? You're looking at the big picture, sure. but there are a lot of things that fall through the cracks. 
And it's important to make sure that you do stay organized, right? So, so people have multiple LLCs, and sometimes they forget which LLCs they have because sure. it's. Just, <laughs> mm -hmm. So keeping keeping organized notes, knowing what your assets are, how they're titled, it's all very important. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best examples of of bad planning was Whitney Houston, who passed away with no will, and her assets mm -hmm. went to her ex husband, Bobby Brown, and their daughter. Uh, Christina, I think was her name, Christina Brown. And then she, mm -hmm. remember, she committed suicide or died. Mm -hmm. And then her assets also went to Bobby Brown. So I think, from what I've read, 100% of Whitney Houston's assets went to her ex-husband, Bobby Brown, ended up with everything. That's interesting. So, and that's actually a really good point, because when you don't have estate planning documents, then it's the probate code that says where your property's going to go, mm -hmm. right? So... It may go to the sister that you haven't spoken to in 30 years. Right. Right. And yeah. we ha and we have cases where people come out of the woodwork oh, and they, they haven't do. spoken to someone in so many years, and they're um, they're entitled to receive That's these tough. things. That so it, um, you want to you, you want to make sure that that you are in the position to make that decision. Yeah. I, I feel like there's some was some unusual lack of paperwork set up with Prince's death as well, wasn't mm -hmm. there? Didn't Prince, he lack something? Mm -hmm. was yeah. He had a will, lacked but a no. will. Oh, he lacked a will. That was Didn't it. he lack a will? <clears throat> when he, he did lack a will. Whenever you hear of anybody's estate in the news, <laughs> yeah, <it's bad. laughs> that means, and, and, and who's getting what, and how much everything was worth, that means that it became public record. Right. That yeah. means they yeah. didn't have... They don't talk about the ones where everything trust. went smoothly. That's yeah. right. It makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, no. <laughs> if it's in the news, it went bad. That's okay. a good point. Yeah. So we kind of talked about the change in taxation as it rose to $11 million as a mm -hmm. really good reason to revisit your estate plan. But how often should people be revisiting their estate plan? Three to five years. Three to five years. Yeah, depending on your circumstance, right? So if you're having, if you're in child bearing years and you're having additional children, right, you're going to want to revisit it. If you have a child that has special needs, you're going to want to revisit it. If you come into a great deal of wealth, you're going to want to revisit it. Um, if you have fallen out with the people that you've put in as agents in your documents, <laughs> right. you want to revisit right. it. Um, so three to five years is generally what we say. Uh, I mean, it just it's something that you that you want to make sure that you do. And if if something changes, obviously look at it at that point in time. But just as a as a safety thing, three to five years. Okay. So now we're going to change the subject, and we're going to talk to Kevin Day about asset protection. I find this subject very interesting, and uh, I'm a CPA, and you'd think I would know a lot of what you're going to talk about, and I actually don't think I did until we had you on the show we a couple times. Talking, so, right. Yes. Yeah, it's a very, it's not a well-trodden path for lawyers, even. So what is meant by asset protection? What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> a, a typical lawyer, if you ask a real estate lawyer, corporate lawyer, an estate planning lawyer for lawsuit protection, they're going to say, oh, how many assets do you have and you need a bunch of LLCs? And that's the end of story. Uh, that does protect whatever's in that LLC from other things. So it protects your home from this business, for instance. Uh, but that still means you're losing something. And um, there's just so much more that can be done, and that's what our firm specializes in. So what, what happens or what do you do to set up an asset protection plan? Well, first we do an analysis, uh, not only just the hard assets, but the objectives of, of the client. Uh, privacy might be part of it, but not necessarily. And we, this is an oversimplification, but we make three categories. Zero liability assets like cash and portfolio, high liability assets like where you have employees or you have tenants, and then there's things in between. And real estate's a great example of that because it's high value, but it also has tenants and things that can go wrong on the property that are outside of your control. So we want to treat those three categories in, in different ways. And we certainly want to get the cash and portfolio away from the human, away from the client. 
certain things need to be in the client's names, but we have other strategies to, to protect assets that have to remain in the client's names. So we, we talked to Elizabeth about the, the things that can go wrong. If you don't have an asset plan, and I already know the answer to this because I've seen it go wrong uh, with a lot of people, is if you don't have asset protection, what are some of the things that can go wrong? I know there can be, oh. you know, just something simple like an employee sues you and or trips at your rental property and you know sues you for twenty five million dollars and you've got insurance and you've got you know an LLC but it flows yeah. over. So what are some of the things if you don't do asset oh. protection that you can our our, unfortunately, our society has geared our, the situation up that we, we are the most litigious society in the world. We have something like 95% of the world's lawsuits. Um, the, the, we have contingency fee attorneys, which means that uh, people can go to an attorney and become a partner with them to sue. Um, and our clients, the overwhelming majority, come and say, you know, uh, you know, my spouse is talking me into this lawsuit protection plan, or my lawyers and CPAs are talking me into this, <clears throat> but I'm a good guy or a good gal, and I'm going to do the right thing, and I'm not going to do anything wrong. And our legal system doesn't care whether you've done something wrong. Uh, you would think that that should be a bigger component. But the law has a couple of uh, ways to tick things off and make you responsible. And there is, with, even within the court system, an expectation that, oh, you have wealth and this person was harmed in some way, so you're not going to be as harmed as much if we take a little bit of your estate and give it to this person mm -hmm. that didn't have much wealth and happened to be harmed because of one of your employees or because of one of your properties. Uh, and you just don't, you've worked really hard for these things. Um, we're not going to tell somebody to do away with insurance, but when you're getting verdicts, you know, for somebody that, uh, you know, got harmed and had hospital, you know, uh, expenses and they're getting a $7 million judgment, uh, when the harm doesn't by any reasonable standard look like it matched that and you only have insurance for you know three million you're going to be losing your rental that they got harmed at or you might if they can pierce the corporate veil they're taking your home and your savings uh, so we have legal ways that people can avail themselves to give more protection than just having an LLC wrapping a, a real estate investment away from your home. Mm -hmm. Protection for being attractive, right? A, an mm. attractive target is essentially what we're talking about. Because we, like Kevin said, we have a very litigious society. Mm. And when you are a plaintiff's attorney and you're looking at it, you're trying to evaluate a case and whether you're going to take it, if you're taking it on contingency, you need to make sure that the pot is big enough so that there's a benefit to you, right? You get paid. Right. And so in these <laughs> circumstances, yeah. and. And we all know that there are lots of lawsuits that should never happen. But you still have to defend yourself, right? You still have to pay attorneys. You have to go through that whole process. That's really what we're talking about here is just being an attractive target um, when, when you could take steps to not be, right? So that could be, if I could be a less attractive target, perhaps less people would be focused on attempting to take stuff from me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. We work hard. Everybody works hard. Why would you just... Yeah, you should definitely look at it. Yeah. Privacy is not lawsuit protection per se, but lowering the profile. And we have ball players and actors that have reasons to not have their name in the public record. But just a plain Jane or plain Joe that has some real estate or has businesses and have several might want to lower their profile for that very reason, that if somebody is thinking of somebody as a lawsuit target, that they don't see everything that you own, and therefore we're narrowing the scope of what they think that they can get from you. Mm -hmm. And what I guess a foundational concept that the the viewers would would like to to learn about is uh, in litigation after it starts, it has very little to do with the real harm. It has to do with how much 
the plaintiff's lawyer is saying, you're going to be devastated, we're going to take your home, we're going to take all your savings, if you don't give us another $2 million. And if it looks like you have $2 million to give, they're going to keep on pushing. There's no incentive for them to settle early. We give them incentive not to sue at all, or if they do sue, they're not, they don't have a high expectation. Because there's so many people that don't do this and are much better targets, right? So when they see this mm -hmm. level of protection, they kind of go, oh, well, let's, I'm not going to take that contingency fee case or because there's 10 other ones that are much easier. Precisely. Right. So it's, it, 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 you, that, that's a first level of protection for your client. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the privacy planning, and I know some high profile people mm -hmm. do that. What is privacy planning? Privacy planning is really lowering, going through how you look in the public record. Uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, you had to hire a private investigator and spend a lot of money. Now you can just get online and you can find out where people lived since they were you know, seven and who the neighbors were and find everything about them. So part of uh, a planning area, a lot of people come to us not for lawsuit protection planning, but just lowering their profile in the public record. Uh, on the lawsuit protection side, it's not lawsuit proofing, but it goes a long way to the strategy that you mentioned of, of disincentivizing you as a target. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to, to lower there? I'm just curious what, what that well, means. Yes. I'm curious about that being, yeah. I'm a forensic accountant, so we do yes. a lot of research about people online and there's mm -hmm. tons of information. So yeah. what, what is it you do so we can't find there, that information? There's a couple of ways and we're trust lawyers. You know, uh, we, we deal with corporations and we form companies all over the country, all over the world. Uh, but trusts are amazing animals because they are a separate legal person from you, the human. And one of the things in lawsuit protection is it really boils down to ownership. If you technically own something, then the plaintiff can take it. And so an irrevocable trust is a separate owner from you, where a corporation is a separate owner from you, but it has to have an owner, and that's usually going to be you. Or it's going to be an LLC, and then you. Or a corp, a corp, a corp, and then you. And if somebody sues you, not the underlying real estate, then they come down the chain. It doesn't matter how many companies are there. They get the first one, they get the whole chain of ownership. Trusts are a, a totally different being and are out there as a separate owner to the point where you have legal deniability. Under penalty of perjury, do you own Golden Mountain funding of Nevada or Wyoming that are privacy jurisdictions for companies? And you can legally say no because an irrevocable trust owns it. And then, as I just mentioned, corporations in the right jurisdiction can uh, have privacy associated with it. Now we're here in California, how do you deal with that? Well, because of fair faith and credit between the states at the U.S. constitutional level, we have to accept companies and trusts from other jurisdictions the way they come. So we can import that privacy from a Wyoming company, for instance, uh, in its uh, formation uh, as a foreign company doing business in California. So in terms of the privacy, the, the, the person's name, if that's all we're looking for, mm -hmm. is it's, it's just got so many layers of companies and trusts and things that it just doesn't pop out to you that quickly, Well, right? it, it doesn't have to be a bunch of layers. Uh, let's say you have a, an actor and she doesn't want people to know where she lives. We can either use a privacy trust, which is usually our first go at it, but some people will have several other real estate that they stay at but they also don't want their name associated with again we can use a privacy trust or we can use a foreign company that has a uh, doesn't uh, a state that doesn't put managers in the public record or allows uh, a hired gun to be the manager in the public record so mm -hmm. our client's name doesn't show up as owning that property oh very interesting so can a person really protect their cash, their home, and their business with one foundational structure? Is that really possible? It is. So the, the, as we 
started out, the typical answer of most people that even say, hey, we know a lot about asset protection is putting eggs in different baskets, and, and that's a good thing. But here in California, particularly, where you know we don't have a $35 a year annual fee, we have an $800, you know, $800 minimum franchise tax, and another you know, 150 or whatever for uh, uh, annual registrations. Uh, people kind of get vexed, and it becomes complicated to have a lot of companies. So we can streamline it by having a lawsuit protection plan with a lawsuit proof type trust interfacing with one real estate holding company where we put whether it's one property or 14 properties we can protect those properties we can strip the equity uh, there's a bunch of different strategies that we have we can move the liquid cash into that one asset protection plan so um, not everybody's circumstances work for it, uh, but many do. So a lot of people were big fans of simplicity. We mm -hmm. don't want to people, you know, the answer is, you know, 14 LLCs. And if you still get personally sued, it all gets taken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so having a, a simplified plan means it'll be used. So what are what are offshore trusts and why do people need to ha to have those? Uh, offshore trusts, we're really looking at if somebody's estate is um, three and a half million, certainly four million and above. Uh, we're going to seriously take uh, have them seriously take the time to get educated on offshore trusts because the U.S. signed the Hague Convention in 1987. Um, it became the law of the land that U.S. people could use offshore trusts and offshore law and that that would be the law of the land here. So effectively, it removes U.S. court jurisdiction over that trust if somebody wants to bust it. We're really importing foreign law. We're not exporting assets. And so if you're a larger estate, uh, even smaller estates that have high liability, uh, restaurant owners, people that just have a lot of doors, you're just rolling the dice. You, you want a bigger hammer and the offshore is appropriate. <laughs> if you're, you know, all you have is a home and a coffee, coffee cart, you can't buy enough insurance for one bad E. coli event at your little coffee oh. cart. Um, but offshore is too expensive. We have domestic versions that will work for the small entrepreneur. So that was my next question, is why would you need a domestic asset protection trust? When you can't, everything is lovely about the offshore trust. It's recognized by the IRS. There's special filings for it that is part of the defense file uh, that is wonderful in court. Um, uh, it removes U.S. court jurisdiction, but they're expensive. So the domestic version makes it very affordable for a very small entrepreneur uh, to, to get true lawsuit protection. So their savings, their nest egg, and their home can't be taken. Mm -hmm. It sounds so complicated. So can, <laughs> I, I, I'm guessing every person's very different depending upon what holdings they have. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing that probably the best advice as we close out your portion of it is to sit down and talk with you and, and have an initial meeting and say, this is what I have, here's, here's what I want to accomplish. And you're going to raise things that probably we don't even think about in terms of potential liabilities. Mm -hmm. You definitely don't want to wait till it's too late. And that's something that we see, right? I All mean, when you, when, you're, when, you, when you are coming to an asset protection attorney, mm -hmm. right, you're coming obviously because you, you're aware of a potential issue. You understand that you have potential liability or that you are a little bit too financially vulnerable. Um, so take the step. I mean, uh, uh, people come to us when it is too late. Sometimes, mm. sometimes it is, and people mm. think asset protection. Oh, I, I, I'm getting sued, and I have. There's certain things that we can do in certain circumstances, mm. but um, yeah, just be proactive. That would be my biggest advice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both, uh, Elizabeth Tress, mm. Kevin Day, <laughs> with you. Tresp Day and Associates here in Solana Beach. Look them up. Um, mm -hmm. Boy, Karen's good to be back. Yes. Yes. Thank Our first you. guest back. We're, we're, we got glad, we're glad that you're back, and we're <laughs> glad that we were uh, 
invited for your first That's show. That's right, the guinea pig. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Until next time.